basically is growing clothing from the work up to. Next, I have a few illustrations with urban workers of one type or another. This one is a surgeon's workshop in which you find a barber surgeon and his apprentices at work uh, dealing with boils, abscesses, teeth that have to be pulled, and things like that. The work clothing of a man. Here you have an alchemist at work. We'll have a scholar at work. Uh, both of these are wearing the lined cloaks that were standard indoor wear in the winter. Yes. Excuse me, Virginia. Some of the uh, pictures you've been passing around, there's a group of three over there, and I just saw a couple more. The images have a strongly purplish cast, and I was wondering, have, was that in the a characteristic of the original artwork, or is it an artifact of the printer, computer, printer, uh, etc.? Actually, it's an artifact of discolored varnish over the years. That's why painting restoration is a art profession in and of itself removing Victorian varnish so one can get back to see the actual color of the painting at the time it was done. If you see the one of the Swan Tavern come through, it's been restored and you'll find that the colors are really quite bright and vibrant. Most of this color, this coloration comes from uh, Victorian varnish. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, this is a picture. This is a pen and ink drawing. When in Karen Offord's latest story, he has Pastor Kasten Meyer's son who yearns to look like James Dean, thinking about the clothes his mother picks out for him to wear to school, he reflects that Salome's value on clothing focused on the word durable. That's the She's talking he about. foresaw a future in which he was going to be wearing plain, dark brown doublets and pants until he got out of the university and could afford to buy himself something else because plain, dark brown, tightly woven wool lasted and lasted and didn't show the dirt. So this is your basic clothes that a young man uh, would be wearing. Uh, here you have another oncoming young scholar uh, with uh, his suit there, one way or the other. Basically what we've been looking at thus far is working class clothing, artisan class clothing. I'm moving now into what we will call uh, lower middle class. Uh, pictures of people, mostly again in uh, tabrics. Uh, you'll find that the difference here is that if you're dealing with people who work scribes, clerks, that type of thing, the clothing is somewhat fuller. They don't have to worry about getting it caught in the machinery. The coloration is somewhat more varied, but basically it's pretty much the same thing. On the one at the bottom, don't look at the man sitting at the table. 
look at the boy who is pouring his wine because that is uh, the clothing that would be worn by a, basically a servant, a servant in a middle class household. Uh, that is your basic apprentice's good suit for the year. It, he's serving at a party, so he's wearing his good suit for the year. And here you have getting into some of the drab blues and things like that. My next set, as we move up the social scale in from the lower middle class into the upper middle class, I have a multiple set of pictures here of the same man. Constantine Huygens, a Dutch diplomat, envoy to England, sometime banker, as he had himself portrayed over the years. I want you particularly to look at the third one in the pile, which is entitled usually Constantine Huygens and his secretary. We have here the phenomenon of the business suit. <laughs> the 17th century businessman dressed as drably as businessmen do today. Not for the businessman was the flamboyant. Not for the businessman was the elaborate. You see, he's got some trimming. He has sedate rows of pleats down his jacket, but they're the same color as the underlying fabric. He has sedate lace trim on the top of his stockings, but they match his dark brown suit. Uh, he's wearing a hat. In the 17th century, there was no etiquette against men wearing hats indoors. It was cold in those buildings in the winter. There were occasions of protocol in which a man greeting a superior was expected to doff his hat, but then he put it back on. If you look at pictures of people having an audience with the Holy Roman Emperor in Vienna in the middle of winter, they're all standing around with their hats on. It was cold. They're standing around with their coats on. It was cold. Uh, an example of it was cold, and I think one of the funniest examples of it was cold that uh, exists is one of Luther's sermons. It was from a century earlier, but the heating situation had not changed in the interval. <laughs> and he was doing a table talk to his students around dinner, and the topic came up, um, was it worthwhile for ministers to preach on the topic of modesty? And Martin Luther opined that he had been to Rome as a young man, and it had been hot down there in Rome. And as he understood, it was hot in the Holy Land, and it was hot in Greece, and it was hot in Egypt, and it had been hot most of the places where the apostles and evangelists and prophets had lived. And indeed, in places where it was hot, there was a tendency for people to wear an insufficient amount of clothing to ensure modesty. And it might have been worthwhile, therefore, for the church fathers to preach about. On the other hand, they lived and would be working in Saxony or Denmark 
or Sweden or Pomerania. And as they looked out among the congregation in their church, they would discover that the women were sitting there wearing dresses that covered them from here down to there <laughs> with four padded petticoats underneath and a scarf around their neck and a hat on their head and gloves and woolen socks and high boots and heated bricks under their feet so they could stand to stay there during the sermon. And when women wear that much covering, there is no point in bothering to preach about <laughs> modesty. <laughs> you can preach about luxury if you want to, if you think some of them are indulging in too much trimming on their clothes. But preaching about sheer practical modesty has no point at all, because just the effort to keep yourself warm enough to survive in Germany ensured that you would be modest, whether you really wanted to be or not. The next set that I'm going to come talk about moves us up one more social step from the businessman, the diplomat wearing his, to the gentleman. This is an actual suit of clothing for, from the period. Uh, not a reproduction, but one of the few surviving pieces of clothing that has lasted from then to now. It was found in a trunk. And this is what a man who didn't have to worry about dirt and ink stains and other hazards of the diplomatic and business life would wear for good. Not for relaxation at home, but rather for good. A lot of people, as these fashions with the new fuller pants were coming in in the early 17th century, thought they were hilarious. This is a very famous uh, etching laughing at a French pop. Uh, we have here several illustrations of the translation of the French fop into real life. People of the 1630s at parties, where if you look carefully, you will find the men are wearing the same thing that the fop was wearing. Uh, this was not a fad that lasted long. The full pants are indeed male fashion in the 1630s. They lasted about as long as the leisure suit. Uh, and then they went away again. And to the best of my knowledge, it's unlikely that they're ever going to come back. They had certainly never shown any signs of it. Uh, here is a man wearing that kind of clothing from the back view. So you can get 